So they are alternates, but really to reach scale, uh, most of the minerals do uh, come out of the out of mining. So I think the the chemistry evolving will uh, bring in new materials into the spotlight, and everybody is very focused that the minerals be scalable. Welcome to the Blue Circle and thank you all for joining in today. Uh, it's such a big privilege and a pleasure to reconnect with everyone, our distinguished panelists who are handpicked because of the think input and the rich experience they bring in. Uh, some of who have previously joined us even at EVCon India, which was the premier program for leaders in the EV category. And thank you to our distinguished audience for joining us. We've received over 350 registrations and 90% of whom are CEOs, CXs and business heads. Many of them are repeat visitors to our webinars. So this is very encouraging and motivates us to provide even higher levels of dialogue to the online channels as well. And for those of you who are new with us today, the Blue Circle is an ecosystem to help business leaders manage disruptive times and become future ready. We focus on four fundamental sectors, which are e-mobility, energy, real estate, and healthcare. We also present socioeconomic insights, which ultimately determine the evolving complexion of the market. In response to the COVID challenge, the Blue Circle has also accentuated its digital presence. One of the many modes we employ is our weekly webinar series, our digital publication. We're building a hand-picked domain-focused expert pool drawn from among our leadership community or from our member base and its associates that will guide businesses during and post-COVID across these four sectors. In addition to this, and you will be happy to know that we are very soon launching an exclusive digital platform, somewhat like the LinkedIn for leaders, but with, a, with focus on real learning and, and idea exchange to raise the caliber of the conversation on a more frequent basis, wherein we will also present the opportunity for leaders to connect with each other, also house high quality curated content and meaningful conversations. So those leaders who are interested, please do write to us. We're also reaching out to leaders in the next one week or so. And the topic for today's session is alternative raw materials for EV battery supply chain. We have prominent practitioners and thought leaders from the sector today. And now in the best interest of time, I will just quickly mention their respective names and designations. We have with us Mr. Adam Dahlquist, CEO, Ultra Sebi, Mr. Jubin Verges, CEO and co-founder Gigadine Energy, Mr. Piyush Gupta, CEO Lithion Power, Mr. Vikram Handa, MD Epsilon Carbon, and our moderator for the session is Mr. Pavan Chaudhary, best-selling author, CEO of French multinational Vigon India, and sits on several boards across the country. Welcome, sirs, and uh, pleasure to have you join us today. Uh, kindly note that we will have Q&A towards the end of the session. Some of you have already shared excellent questions which are with the moderator. And now I request Mr. Chaudhary to please begin the session. Thank you very much, Siddharth. And whatever questions I've got, I've already shared with the panelists just five minutes before. And we will try to weave uh, these questions in the talk track. And um, so since the first zinc silver battery which was invented by Alessandro Volta. The battery has seen a lot of evolution and has stayed with us for the last more than 200 years. It is now again the new star of science. The last year's Nobel Prize for chemistry, as you know, went to three scientists who, for their work on lithium ion battery. Today we will talk about the EV battery, which in a different avatar, in a little variant, uh, is also the energy storage battery. Actually, it was this energy storage avatar which got me interested in this field because I was looking along with a friend of mine for an alternative to generators. We have generators in our office. He has done generator in his hosp generators in his hospital and we were looking for uh, something better. Uh, he bought an energy storage system. I did not. 
and um, frankly speaking there are uh, of course i consider that he has been the pioneer which i could not be but i sometimes chuckle in my heart that my generator today is still a little better option than uh, his energy storage system device so and why is that so uh, this is what we are going to discuss today uh, and we we'll focus on the raw material components of battery which uh, which are actually surrounded this entire supply chain is surrounded by very highly technical complex legal commercial um environmental and even social factors why because battery manufacture as you know requires certain minerals lithium cobalt nickel and copper are critical among them and their substitutes are limited and supplies are geographically concentrated also their extraction and refining are surrounded as i said by several social factors so their extraction practices may be unsafe or sub subject to social un unrest these this limited availability uh geographical concentration and other issues have further got compounded with the changes which geopolitics has seen has seen and this supply chain has got further bottlenecked so this is where i would like to start it from and i will ask adam to tell us what are these minerals or other components which a battery requires and why is their supply chain so complex or uh, let me say bottleneck today adam and thank you uh, you're right there there are several bottlenecks uh, for raw material for lithium ion batteries uh, you find several of the substances on the european union's list of critical raw materials is cobalt is on that list phosphor lithium and natural graphite is also on that list to start up start out with a with a lithium 78% is produced of all lithium today is produced in chile in one country uh more famously for the concentration is is maybe cobalt where but actually it's only if i say like that 68% of all cobalt manufactured in cobalt in congo but there is even more issues with um, with uh, child labor and and uh, slave like reports from from congo uh, but it doesn't stop there uh looking at uh, uh manufacturing of or, or mining of uh, slave graphite 65% come from china so of course there's a issue where we have a lot of concentration of uh, substances from one country one region of the world but it's not only the concentration also the scarcity of those raw materials um uh, and there also issue as you pinpointed there mr shadre that they are mined uh, we actually dig them up from the ground which make our generation in depth of future generation um the scarcity and the way we source those raw materials make them also expensive uh the 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 issue with price will be worse in the future since the demand for batteries will be tenfold in the next 10 years so uh, it is an issue we need to find other solutions uh, alongside lithium ion batteries to really be able to, to supply the battery that the world needs uh very well you said lithium you, you hinted that lithium is the close sharpest crimp of this bottleneck and you also spoke about prices where cobalt has gone up five times in the last six years the price has gone uh, that much up and uh, great points what would you like to add to this vikram so i, I agree with uh, adam you know the the industry has been evolving and growing exponentially 
and we have seen a uh, shortage of raw material coming into the supply chain but then people keep talking about it that in the future also there's going to be a, a shortage of raw materials i think that's where it's important to with all the research that's happening and technology evolving to come up with better chemistries of the of the lithium battery itself or of the battery i would say uh with the with better chemistries we can be reliable on uh, different materials different minerals maybe that are more easily accessible cheaper and can be extracted at scale then there are also opportunities on looking at artificial materials you know there are other processes of uh, generating uh, certain raw materials for uh, lithium ion batteries like adam mentioned uh, flake graphite there's also a process that we do uh, called synthetic graphite so there are alternates but really to reach scale uh, most of the minerals do uh, come out of the out of mining so i think the the chemistry evolving will uh, bring in new materials into the spotlight and everybody is very focused that the minerals be scalable the availability very good points you you have made uh, artificial material is the point which you you brought in and uh, where i would like to say also deep sea mining uh, should be uh, should be checked as japan is doing so, uh, so whether the reservoirs of these minerals can be expanded the reserves uh, great points and uh, piyush coming to you what is it that you would like to add to describe the complexity around the supply chain and the limitations around the supply chain uh, in greater detail i think uh, i think it's a, it's a very well known fact the supply chains are fairly concentrated for lithium ion batteries right now you know we have uh, china probably dominating the entire supply chain and uh, because of the geopolitical risks uh, uh, you know we all feel threatened whether we are in india whether we are in the us uh, we all feel threatened by a, such a concentrated supply chain but what we need to keep in mind is this industry has gathered pace only over the last 5 to 10 years right if you go back to 2010 you know people did not really care about lithium ion battery supply chain people really did not care about lithium people really did not care about cobalt people really did not care even about the nickel except the steel industry right so i'm actually not too worried about you know when i look at a 20 10 20 year perspective even from a lithium ion supplies the sources will be diversified yeah whether whether it's going to be the cheapest source i am not so sure maybe we will be able to get supplies out of out of out of deserts somewhere out of some some snow peaks yeah at a 10% 20% more expensive price so i'm actually not worried about the supply you know i often tell people in 1970s people said there is enough oil for 10 years yeah in 1970s the the biggest fear the world had was there is enough oil for 10 years in 2020 we have enough oil for 100 more years yeah so we will have enough lithium we will have enough cobalt we will have enough nickel the world did not need it hence the engineers did not look hard enough yeah now the world needs it the engineers will start looking hard enough the businessman will pay extra to get the supply chain so i'm actually not worried from a from a medium to long term perspective yes from a short term perspective uh, all the geopolitical risks accentuate the problem so that's a, that's a very different perspective that i have on uh, have on you know the apparent doomsday scenario that world is going to run out of lithium china is going to ensure india does not get an you know a gram of lithium i'm i'm actually not worried about that in a in a, in a medium to long term perspective at all excellent point and let me add to it also uh, dwell on it a little more so that uh, we can get into a deeper dialogue around this also so you have said that based on history i can be optimistic about the future and you gave the example of oil i can give you the example of cop uh, uh, copper um, uh, yeah copper copper reserves were supposed to be supposed to last only 50 years in 1950 100 million tons was the copper reserve today the reserves have been revised and 339 million have been mined already though reserves were only 100 million because copper could be extracted like through as an oxide and not just as a sulfide which was the limitation of the technology then 
so reserves are mineable components of minerals reservoirs are the larger component of minerals cryolite was a mineral which was used in the manufacture of aluminium you talked talked about alternatives cryolite we ran out of but aluminium and better and better quality aluminium we continue to make because we found very good substitutes i fully agree with that at the same time there is another line of thought also which is also coming from history that energy which was uh, controlled by the powers of the world churchill creating iraq so that he had an oil supply sub supplying nation uh, for his ships which were required in the war which could do better much better than coal fired ship us creating saudi arabia protectorate to protect the oil china getting into sudan iran and russia getting into the cis countries for oil it should not so happen that something similar happens for uh, for minerals and because if that would happen one monopoly would be replaced through a substitute which will also become extremely monopolistic this is my view uh, and question to you jubin what would you like to say to this uh, first of all pawan thanks for having me i hope everyone is doing fine in this uncertain time uh you know you got you brought up a very valid point in terms of uh you know declustering of power or creating artificial pockets of power right uh and you rightly brought up the point that you know with respect to uh, innovative ideas or innovative solutions coming up to address the need of the hour right uh what we need to focus more upon is that compared to the past right the world has evolved drastically right and what we notice very frequently is that a particular nation becomes hungry for power and they would go to any extent to make sure that you know the opponent or the enemy not saying that what is happening currently is a good example in in the border right we have seen what what china has done with japan in the past right we have seen what china has done with multiple countries in the past i think one of the biggest issue that we have as a country is that we were very late to the entire battery or the ev or the lithium ion race because you know today it's not difficult to set up a manufacturing facility in india for manufacturing a battery the biggest concern is your supply chain unless and until you have a very verified and you know stress free source in terms of supply chain you would not be able to compete with china china sits at a 65% market share in terms of batteries in terms of battery manufacturing technology and also the other raw material which is required right so i think uh, especially for countries like india and the other developing countries who are trying to be independent in terms of their own or trying to create another powerhouse for themselves i think they should also focus on alternatives to lithium ion though lithium ion could address their you know internet uh, internet requirement in terms of batteries to begin the entire ev race for a long term solution i think they should look at alternatives it could be sodium it could be potassium it could be calcium it could be some other derivatives of a lithium ion battery which does not require a nickel or cobalt which are by products and non direct commodities so i think the focus should be on using materials which are com commoditized so easier access in terms of entire supply chain excellent points excellent additions so uh, you are basically adding to what uh, piyush said that it is true that there might be reserves which are not yet found but it is also possible that they are geographically still concentrated or they could be commercially concentrated that means the reserve may be in a country let us say congo but it is owned by let us say a superpower like china and that can limit our options so, so what you said is that uh, in the geo, uh, what you alluded to i felt that in the in the changing geopolitics we should keep our gates open for if not random offshoring at least friend shoring of these materials from those countries with which we have a peaceful history as well as well as maybe similar political dispensation uh, and meanwhile we should look at alternatives so coming to the alternatives i'll go back to adam and i ask him uh, that please describe the battery as to what are the three components it has and then tell us what are the what are the alternative raw materials which are emerging on the horizon for batteries adam yes um, from a 
this is a scarcity of raw materials is, is not something new. Uh, research have been looking into this issue for decades. Uh, and uh, one of the elements that is, has been perhaps mo most interest is, is sodium, that since it's so similar to lithium, uh, and since there are thousand times more reserves of sodium than lithium, and that also reflects on the price. Uh, lithium carbonates cost 30 times more than, than uh, sodium carbonates. Um, so it's, it's, it's for sure great incentives to do research about that and, and find sodium ion batteries as an alternative for lithium ion batteries. Uh, there have been a lot of research. Uh, there may be the most prominent researchers, Nobel Prize winner, uh, Prof Professor Goodenough, released the article five, six years ago about one uh, sodium ion uh, battery chemistry uh, that is called Prussian White in a research language. At, at my company, we have, we have named that FENAC. Uh, FENAC has as a cathode material. The cathode is the, the, substance, the, the part of the battery that decides most of the features for the batteries, uh, most critical part of the battery, more or less. Uh, and this FENAC contains only one, one metal, and that is iron. The origin, original sources for the other elements in FANAC are air, it is seawater, and a forest. Uh, when, um, when there were three researchers from Uppsala University here, looking, inspired by this article, looking into this, uh, this battery chemistry of FANAC, they saw there were, were only one missing link to make this commercial, and that was, the, was that it was very expensive to synthesize this, uh, this cathode material. Uh, the method that uh, Professor Goodenough used had needed a lot of heat and a lot of pressure. So he, it works fine to do research about it, to, but to make commercial business about it was not viable. Those Uppsala University uh, researchers found a new way of synthesizing this metal, this cathode material, uh, at very low temperature and no pressure. Uh, using raw material that is very cheap, make it a very competitive cathode material. And it was kind of like locking up the last problem issue, making a, a competitive uh, sodium ion battery. Yeah, great. Uh, well, you were saying something else? Yeah, um, I, for this, this, uh, this battery is, is, is for sure one of several chemistries that battery chemists that will exist on the market. Uh, there are still lithium ion batteries will be needed for portable electronics, for instance, uh, at least some of the chemistries there, since they are the highest energy density. But when you have um, other aspects where price is important, where power is important, or where safety is important, then uh, sodium ion batteries is more often more better alternatives. Uh, so I would say that sodium ion battery generally will be the dominant technology on, on stationary storage. Uh, for portable electronics, it will also in the future be lithium ion battery that will dominate that sector. While for electric vehicles that we speak about today, you will have a mix of sodium ion batteries and, and uh, lithium ion batteries. Great, great point. So uh, uh, there is an uh, there are two electrodes the cathode and the anode and the electrolyte and the anode is not so uh, let me say is not so starved of material it is the cathode which is more star starved of material and one of the materials which you are proposing uh, through the is this of course the sodium ion uh, through uh, through your sodium ion battery you have spoken about the price, the power, and the safety. We will come back to that and particularly the safety. But before that, let us go to Vikram and ask him, Vikram, what are the other alternative uh, products or minerals through which batteries can be made like aluminum or carbon? And what is your view on uh, their usefulness uh, or viability in the coming future? So I think Adam touched on a very good point about, um, you know, different chemistries of the cathode that are evolving. And I think, the, like you said, the cathode is a, is a very key product 
where a uh, lot of development is happening and co commercialization is happening on that side quicker. I can tell you a little bit about the anode side, uh, which uh, there was a lot of natural flake graphite, like he mentioned earlier, that is being used to make anodes. And there was also technology of synthetic anode that came out of Japan primarily, and which has now been commercialized in China and other parts of the world. So the, the anode journey is going a bit from natural to synthetic so that you can control the product better and give uh, higher specification anode. The, the, the journey of the anode continues uh, with silicon in it, with lithiumization in it. So the anode is evolving as well, but maybe not at the pace of the cathode or the electrolyte. Right? And the anode will always remain, a big chunk will be graphite. So the anode evolution is not so fast and so rampant as maybe the other components in the battery. And the cathode is pretty much dictating what is the chemistry of the cell. Right, so. yeah, it's, it's the vital piece here. And uh, Piyush, would you like to add to this uh, and uh, tell us what, uh, which is the other battery technology you feel which might uh, be the next contender after lithium? I think that's, a, that's not a million dollar question. It's almost a billion dollar question. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, quite candidly, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, there are obviously, uh, you know, sodium uh, is kind of, uh, you know, a bit more established than some of the other contenders. And then we have, uh, we have zinc oxide, aluminum oxide as, as other contenders. But frankly, I really don't have a view as to which is going to be the first one uh, that's going to be commercialized on a really mass scale. But uh, I uh, but there's one thing for sure, right? Uh, there are so many smart people working on it across the world. Someone or else is going to crack the code. But again, you know, I just go back to history. I've been saying the same thing for fuel cells and hydrogen cells for the last 20 years, and it hasn't happened. Yeah? So, but again, uh, smart people are working on it. Uh, it's just a matter of time. Someone or, uh, someone or the other is just going to crack the code. Yeah, you're very right. Uh, Elon Musk has said that fuel cells are fuel cells. But we take his criticism with a pinch of salt because he is talking about a possible competitor. And uh, we are also noticing that the cost of uh, hydrogen cells is coming down and the infrastructure led by, country, uh, like, led by states like California, etc., is going up. But I, but I am in, largely in agreement with what you have said. And uh, nice point you've added regarding hydrogen cells. We should talk about that sometime. Uh, coming to Jubin, Jubin, please add to uh, our knowledge of what could be the other battery chemistries uh, which uh, may have a good chance of becoming viable and successful tomorrow. What's your view? Oh, Pawan, I'm itching to say that's the chemistry that we are developing back at Gegedine. Uh, but tell me, on a, tell me. Yeah. No, but on, on a side note, right, uh, there's a lot of interest in terms of, so we get a lot of queries from people asking, you know, can we have a battery pack? How soon can we get hands on your technology? Why only the OEM channel partners are getting your technology? Why not the retail market, right? Uh, in my perspective, and I'm, we constantly speak with a lot of uh, industry thought leaders and, you know, veterans in battery space and OEM space, right? Uh, my two cents, and I still think that, you know, I'm still a smaller fish in the, in the ocean of energy storage and energy generation, etc. Right? My two cents is that uh, there's not going to be one stop solution which will address all your problems. Right? The right way to look at who's going to be the next contender to the lithium ion is to develop chemistry which are application specifics. For example, if I, I do not require a high energy density battery, if I'm using a stationary grid or if I'm doing something for my backup power, right? Their TCO model is more, more important and I need to build a battery which has a longer cycle life. If I'm targeting electric vehicles, if I'm targeting last mile logistics, right? The, 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 the code over, over there is fast charging, high energy density batteries. So it all depends upon what chemistry that we're targeting and what is the application that we're looking to replace to begin with, right? I think one of the most important aspect over here is for us Indians to understand that we do not lose the race, like what happened in terms of solar, right? We had a head start with respect to the entire solar race. What happened is Chinese started dumping the solar panels in our market and then eventually, you know, 
though we have a good uh, good real estate in terms of capturing solar energy right we couldn't just win the race i think we should learn from our mistakes and what we should focus on you know to start rip like you mentioned dg set is a very important aspect that needs to be replaced first in our country right or approximately per unit cost of electricity generation why diesel generator has around 15 to 17 rupees a unit right the moment you replace that with the, let's say you get batteries into picture right you get it down to 6 to 7 rupees a unit now the the key part of the puzzle is to start introducing solar or renewable energy inside this now if we are able to combine solar with batteries and then start doing this and start you know generating electricity you drop the price as low as 1 and 1/2 to 2 rupees and it is happening in real time right today if you look at the solar pricing across the country it's come down to as low as 2 point something and people are still bidding for those kind of pricing right which means even at those kind of pricing it is becoming attractive for people to to put up those kind of solar farms and generate electricity i think that is a very important puzzle to solve first not the electric vehicle not your high energy density batteries in a country like india right one of the biggest thing that we have learned running our business for the past 3 4 years is that you know what indians want is a robust technology which is built like german which has a reliability of a japanese uh, quality which has a good design like a german and which is value for money so it's something like we say turn in a sasta tikau sundar if you are able to crack this code right you have a technology which can be scaled anywhere in the world so if you win the indian market it is that much easier for you to go back and expand in global global market right having said that i think the next best alternative to a lithium ion battery would be something which would which would which would have a mixture of sodium along with different ion and carbon would play a main main uh, majority role in terms of defining the chemistry that is going to go forward right like said if you want to build something which is dirt cheap you might as well build, build it out of dirt and what better dirt than carbon to build a tech battery technology so i think it's going to be a combination of sodium it's going to be a combination like i said of multiple ion that goes around the sodium persian blue is another contender persian white like adam is developing is another good contender for as an alternative uh, to bat- uh, to a lithium ion solution so i think you know it's going to be a mixture of uh, an alternative ion along with carbon which which can give you a longer cycle life and a decent energy density you know lfp batteries lithium ion phosphate batteries were written off completely across the globe and i am a high i am a big advocate for low energy density high cycle life battery because i feel you know how do you make people start switching from an existing infrastructure to another infrastructure you need to give them the taste of the new infrastructure right you can't expect people to just randomly go and start buying electric vehicle which cost 3 to 4x in what a conventional uh, car would cost for them to buy so for them you need to make the batteries more affordable now one way to do that is to decouple the battery from from the main vehicle itself but then there are multiple challenges around it i think that would work better like a hub and spoke model maybe for public transportation and there are multiple you know business models which have proved it so i think with respect to that that is a good option but then when you're talking about larger business scale perspective i think you need to have batteries which are affordable and which have a longer cycle life so any chemistry which are able to crack these two important piece will be able to go to commercial that much faster excellent so you have said that uh, you have brought in another angle you have you have said that different strokes for different folks absolutely maybe maybe this mineral based battery will be good for these people because they require high energy density and these people require greater storage and you have brought in the example of uh, the power supply which is consumed as it is produced and intermittent sources of power like sun or wind etc do not have enough storage capacity right now so right now basically the convention energy we are producing and consuming simultaneously this is world's largest supply chain you are saying that supply chain alternatives will be different and because their requirements are different the supply chain of power and the mobility alternatives may be different and uh, uh, that's a great point and the other point which you brought in uh, i should add to uh, our discussion which was happening between uh, uh, all of us and piyush that photovoltaic cell also he made a point that substitutes will be found i just remembered that photovoltaic cells required indium and gallium compulsorily till about a few years back but today photovoltaic cells are made with silicon so which is not a mineral which is not a rare earth and it is doing almost as well perhaps tomorrow uh, swanson's law says that the more you manufacture the cheaper it will become 
Moore's law says the more you manufacture, in other terms, in other words, the more uh, efficient or uh, productive it will become. So I think these things will also roll out there in the EV space. Coming back to Adam. Adam, we would like to know what are the main weaknesses which lithium ion batteries have today? Because that will also point perhaps to the direction as to where the challenger will come from or who can be the next dependable contender in this uh, uh, game of different uh, strokes for different folks. Uh, Adam. Thank. I think it's valuable to also look back one, one generation before, looking at the uh, lead acid battery, who has the benefit of had really high power to make a combustion engine turn. That, that's what they're doing, and that are really strong on steel. Uh, and then look at, then going over to lithium ion batteries, what they brought to, to the battery sector was the energy density. Uh, make it possible with all those uh, portable electronics we have today. Uh, what have evolved now, uh, partly due to that, that uh, lithium ion batteries have got economy of scale and, and can address more markets due to lower price, that is that, that new markets, sectors have evolved uh, together with that we are trying, that we are going, going strongly to face our fossil energy to renewable energy. We have batteries in many, many more applications. Uh, we have it in electric vehicles and we have it in, in stationary storage. Uh, in those applications, you also need a battery that, that resists temperature changes. And that is a weakness of many of, of, uh, of lithium ion batteries. It's difficult to have, get power in a battery that is minus 20 degrees, for instance. Also, the high temperature is a, is a limiting factor for lithium ion batteries. Um, what they do now is that you, they heat up batteries that is too cold before they can start using them. Uh, another issue in many applications that is, that is uh, the safety or the safety risk. Um, a lithium ion battery, which if you discharge it totally, uh, it starts a non reversible reaction inside the battery, uh, destroying the battery. So you cannot discharge a lithium ion battery totally. That means that you have to transport a charge. And if you have charge in something, it is in some extent dangerous. Uh, that's why it's expensive to transport lithium ion batteries because it's dangerous goods. But it's not only that that is dangerous with lithium ion batteries, it's also that most lithium ion cathodes, when there are uh, short circuits inside the battery, they are, they are dissolving the, the cathode. And what happens when it dissolves, it produces heat and releases oxygen. And that heat and oxygen is right next to electrolyte that is, it is flammable. So you have heat, you have, you have uh, oxygen, and you have something that can, that can, uh, that can, uh, uh, that, that you have, you have, um, no, I lost the name here. You have something that can catch fire. So it's really difficult to, to turn, to, to, to uh, stop a, f a fire in a lithium ion battery. Uh, that's a clear limitation for many applications, and that's something that is really costly to do engineering solutions around to stop those risks. Uh, to go to the to the to another limitation is in power. Well, as I said before, uh, lead acid have a much higher power. Lithium ion lithium ion batteries they have a C rate about one meaning that it takes as, well, about one hour to, to, to put the energy inside a cell. Uh, that, of course, would be nice to be much quicker if you need application where speed is important. Great points. Great points. And uh, on, on that note, uh, we conclude this round and come to Vikram uh, to ask him what is the scope of graphene there's a question which has come on the scope of graphene. Uh, what is your comment on that, Vikram? Well, uh, you know, this goes back to actually a point that uh, Piyush and Zubin brought before. What is going to be the chemistry of the battery going ahead, of the cell going ahead? And there's a lot of research happening and no one knows what's going to be the final solution. But uh, the idea that there'll be different uh, chemistries for different applications makes sense. Even what Adam said, uh, certain 
certain applications require explosion proof certain uh, uh, applications require long distance short distance quick discharge so the battery chemistry will become very solution uh, application based so when you come back to graphene as well uh, again it is a material that is evolving right now there's a lot of focus on it and there's a lot of r and d happening there but it's still at a very much at a pilot stage but most of the technology we actually discussed in the last half an hour are quite proven at a pilot stage so when we talk what is the next technology it's already out there you know it's just not commercialized today but it's already out there and we will see it in the next 5 to 8 to 10 years depending on the speed of adoption get commercialized so while today graphite is the most popular anode material but they in a solid state battery they talk about a different kind of anode material and graphene is another uh, product that they talk about as a possibility right so right. there are a lot of technologies out there that are i would say already proven it's a matter of just taking scaling it up and making it commercially viable to take it to the market for that application which brings us very well to the last part of this discussion which is what is the way forward then now what you have said and what everybody else has agreed to uh, optimistically but objectively based on uh, you have used the light from the history to illuminate the future so it is not optimism but i would say it is uh, based on uh, some solid data which piyush also brought in before us so piyush let us begin by asking you what will make many of these potential uh, or some of these potential solid contenders for the battery space succeed what what will be that secret sauce i think uh, in general in general uh, you need a very solid backer for a specific technology someone who is willing to bet their house or in case if it's a government to bet significantly on uh, on a specific technology you know uh that's that's just what is required you know you require a few billion dollars to be put behind a technology to scale it up yeah whether it comes from a private sector player which is highly unlikely or it comes from a sovereign in which case it could be one of the governments which is trying to get away from lithium ion uh, that's you know you have five or six technologies which are solving use cases in specific instances and uh, and you know the final contender is going to emerge from one of these these five or six uh, technologies right so someone needs to start you, you know people need to start taking huge bets on these technologies and 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 start investing in it and uh, one or two of them will be uh, will 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 become big yeah so people need to deploy capital uh, without capital you are not going to get gains fairly simple capital stool yeah so your your view is that uh, a very solid backer has to be there and uh, hopefully some governments will back this uh another counter or complementary view could be that which are the technologies which have emerged as really big ones with the support just of the government or let me say aligning myself more reasonably uh, to your point of view i would say that haven't governments been uh, blamed to be non thorough and not so good at uh, allocation of resources uh, so the policies which they make sometimes are unpredictable the organizations they create sometimes are not so efficient uh, so what would the rest of the group feel about what piyush has said and i have uh, taken uh, piyush's point uh, one point from his argument there are several other points which he have made and i'm accentuating it a little just so that a dialogue can happen and complementarities of the valid point which piyush has made also can emerge so going to jubin for that jubin what is your view that will will the success of what becomes commercially viable depend in a big way on governments Oh, i have a, a i have a slightly different view on that right i believe that uh, if throwing dollars at a problem could fundamentally solve a problem then you know we would have already found the next big thing to lithium ion 
or for that matter of battery technology per se right uh, i think if you want to get a technology that much closer in terms of commercialization it's about creating a block within the oems right because ultimately a battery company even if it creates a next big solution you need somebody who could put your battery in their end use case and then get it to the general public and the retail crowd so i think it's about creating a block choosing the right oem partner who can go back and push your product through his distribution network so any company who or any technology manufacturer or developer who has a right sort of synergy with an existing manuf- existing oem will be one will be definitely having a big tailwind in terms of getting the product that much closer to commercialization right uh yes governments do play a very pivotal role in terms of getting the technology that much closer a right policy set by the government definitely will give a big boost in terms of you know uh, make ensuring that a uh, priority is given to a technology over the other right but but in terms of india right i think uh, anybody who develops a viable alternative to the mind the government has set this intention pretty clear by stating that you know even the fame policy clearly states out that they're looking for advanced battery chemistries so which clearly means that you know the developers or the scientists have a clear direction from the government that you don't have to create something which is a bit better than the existing version of lithium ion you need to create something which is radically different at the same time it hits the right boxes to ensure that the technology can be that much closer to commercialization uh, also i would just like to touch upon the point that he brought about graphene with respect to how so we can we use graphene in our batteries or is graphene the next big alternative right so we've done a lot of research with respect to different derivatives of gra- carbon and graphene being one of them right now the challenge with graphene is that you know one of the many reasons why people are so excited about using graphene inside a battery is because the energy density theoretically it has around close to 500 watt hour per kg and that would potentially solve a lot of problems when we talk about high energy density batteries right there are two challenges with respect to graphene number one uh, not getting too much scientific into it it starts agglomerating after few cycle which means the good performance that you see during the initial cycle cannot be sustained over a longer period of time which means you know a the production of graphene is highly expensive which means the technology becomes non feasible if you are going to use it over a, over hundreds of cycles so that's the biggest uh, pain point with respect to using graphene in battery technology uh, b the entire process of manufacturing graphene itself is also very expensive right people use hammer's method along with couple of other methods to produce graphene but still there is no technologically or commercially feasible method that can be used at scale to produce graphene which can compi- compete with graphite or any other alternative material to make it that much more economically feasible in terms of uh, getting the battery closer to commercialization i think the sweet spot in terms of battery technology today you have lead acid per kilowatt hour somewhere between 25 2700 to 3000 rupees per kilowatt hour right your sweet spot in terms of battery is to get 1 kilowatt hour of battery or secondary battery as close to 6 or 7000 rupees a kilowatt hour the point you're able to achieve that that's when you know the entire hockey stick movement would happen in terms of mass adoption of electric vehicles or anything which is battery powered in our country yeah uh, point well made in the uh, earlier part of your uh, uh, your intervention you spoke about the fact and you agreed with piyush like i also do that government surely has a role government has a role in bringing a predictable policy so that investors will come in government has a role in making sure the education happens government has a role in bringing out certain uh, technology agnostic uh, incentives because if you bring technology uh, uh, specific policies etc the technological landscape itself is changing so fast then we have problems like sometimes we may have in uh, policies like fame so also government has a role perhaps in investing in adjacent areas like the areas of electrolyzers which is making the h2 uh, hydrogen cells so if you invest in these areas because the chemistry is the same electrolyte uh, electrodes etc there's a lot of poss- possibility of cross fertilization as well as a uh, manpower the same uh, skilling etc is required and can be used interchangeably uh, coming back to uh, what can take this forward what can what will what will be the critical elements which will uh, take the commercialization of a new potential play, uh, player forward is my question to adam now uh, from from a um... my perspective from from an altris perspective uh we we have a clear path for for uh, turning our sodium ion based or fenac based batteries to the market uh, and uh, 
It is fairly simple, uh, thanks to the thanks to that the manufacturing of lithium ion batteries is very similar to sodium ion batteries. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel of how to produce the cathode or anode or, or put it together yourself. Uh, so what we need to do and what we decided to do is to be really good in just making the cathode material and sell that to, 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 to sell producers. Uh, and then of course we need to transfer knowledge so they quickly can change from uh, lithium cell manufacturing to, to, to sodium ion cells manufacturing. Uh, so that's the direction we have chosen and, and that's the quickest way to really transform uh, parts of the lithium ion factories, uh, lithium ion value chain into a value chain around our technology. Uh, and I think we have quite clear arguments for, for the industry to do this since we have many benefits, we are strongest on many many aspects. Uh, uh, so you can find those sectors where where you can be really profitable changing chemistry. Excellent. Um, and just, just a few words about this, what government can do also. I would like to just share a few views on that. If, is that okay, Shoshu? Uh, please, please. Uh, Altris have, have, is a Swedish company. We have got support from the Swedish government. We have got support from the European Union as well. We're really grateful for that. And that it's important for us to take research into business, so to say, to develop the process so it can scale. Uh, but we don't want to, I don't want to have subsidies long in the long run. Uh, I want to be able to stand on our own benefits, so to say. Uh, however, I think that what government need to do is to make sure that the cost of um, mining has the right price. Uh, Swedish government don't take any cost from a mining company, so I'm throwing stones in glass house here. But, um, but I think governments need to actually take the price uh, so it's not so cheaply to mine things that are scarce. Excellent points. You have said that success will depend upon how easily the existing manufacturing capability of lithium ion batteries can switch over to sodium ion batteries. Because if the cost of switchover is too much, then the sunk cost will delay the, uh, the, the reception to sodium ion batteries. Secondly, you have said that, that, that uh, you are grateful to your government and so are we in many ways, uh, that it has supported you and there is some element of basic science also which a government can support the industry through basic science research. And the last point which you said is very interesting, that the government can intervene in another manner. That is through market oversight of mining prices. That means mining prices should not become monopolistic or um, too, uh, too mysterious, you know, uh, clouded in secrecy. Greater transparency in mining prices is important. Great points, and I think you've supported uh, what uh, Piyush made uh, the points which Piyush made, as well as uh, added uh, points which uh, were complementary to his uh, as far as uh, you're depending more on the market and less on subsidies uh, and you would, as you would like to stand on your feet, uh, own feet. Vikram, what do you think is left uh, for the potential uh, winner to become a real winner what should the industry, publics, investor, or the government do? Like, like I said earlier, I think the, the next technology out that's going to be the big technology already exists. Two, three of them maybe that are going to be the leading technologies going ahead. And um, the, the one issue, not issue, the one scenario that everyone has to recognize while we can keep talking about alternate technologies is that they're already about a thousand gigawatt hours of mega factory, giga factories that are already announced and under construction. So that's billions and billions of dollars that are already being deployed and uh, are going to come up in the next four to five years globally. And a lot of them are in Europe and a lot of them are in US as well. So when you have so such a big investment, you can't just write it off and say, okay, now this technology looks better. I'm going to start making this. So it's going to take 
even though as we move from say uh, a technology to commercialization it's going to take time for it to reach that scale because again you're going to have to invest a lot of money if it's a totally different technology but coming to what adam said if it's a technology that's easily adaptable then the transition to a new technology might be quicker right excellent going back, point yeah. sorry go ahead go ahead going back to the government point you know how we started our discussion earlier was should we be looking at friendly nations or how to explore uh, securing raw material to be able to scale up india's uh, journey in the ev sector i think it's a uh, it's very important that one thing is government being active in securing raw material for this journey the other thing is government investing in the next technology what jubin brought up so there are two different aspects where money has to go in and a lot of the easiest person who has the money to do this and in their own interest is the government right so i think a lot of minerals that we talk about in the short term in the lithium ion supply chain are available in india but again mining is not such a focus and there's not such a focus to explore what is available within our own country and make us self reliant at the same time we are not investing sorry i think we have lost uh, go ahead go ahead yeah so i said the private sector doesn't have that kind of money and the government is not looking at investing in the next technology we are a bit behind the curve and we are chasing what others are doing china did it now europe's doing it let's also go secure raw material now this technology is getting commercialized it's more efficient let us get it or figure out how to do it you know so we need to really be more aggressive and try to be ahead of the curve and i think uh, a company like isro in india has done very well of being ahead of the curve where other governments have spent a lot of money but we have come out very successful and benchmarked ourselves very high globally so it's possible in india but uh, they have to be very focused and they need the private sector to help do the research and they need to support it yeah i fully agree with you in fact uh, isro reminds me of korea uh, korea is one country which uh, which through the carrot and stick uh, moved the industry to particular areas lg was in, uh, wanting to get into garments but it said uh, the government said that you will have to make electrical cables and actually pushed it very hard by even uh, uh, saying that the government loans which are given to you will be withdrawn and finally uh, lg moved in the direction set by the government and it was a very successful uh, uh, move same for hyundai hyundai did not want to get into ship building but the government pushed it uh, to get there at the same time the the contrary examples are far more numerous so there have been such cases like isro and the ones which i mentioned where the government has intervened very very positively uh, but for that a lot of thorough planning and far sightedness is required and uh, if we get that then surely as uh, piyush said this could be the uh, this could be a very very strong support to us because i do see that uh, there is understanding in the government that the policies have to be more thorough they have to be more predictable support has to be uh, you know support has to ensure that the the technology is in a state of flux and uh, we bet on the right horses and i also have the ability in our policies to change horses whenever possible uh, coming to piyush any last words piyush and then i'll come to jubin so i think uh, overall uh, i think the we i'm i'm pretty positive about uh, about some new chemistries coming out in the market right uh, what i'm less positive about is essentially how soon they can scale up and then and, and precisely as vikram mentioned right so we have uh, we have a few 100 billion dollars uh, of investment in lithium ion cell manufacturing now right for a new technology to come and then get their cost curves significantly lower than lithium ion is just going to be it's just going to be challenging right but the other thing that we should always keep in mind material science does not progress in a day it progress in decades right so we so, so change from one technology to other is a is not a one year process it's not a five year process it's a 10 20 year process so uh, you know i take a 5 10 15 20 year view i see alternatives uh, i see something in the next five years probably no alternative very 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 informed words 
And uh, I remember that when the plug-in hybrid was launched in US, uh, though it was a very good machine by Toyota, it was uh, uh, it could not take off because of the sunk cost of the ICE manufacturers. It should not so happen that the sunk cost of the I, uh, of the lithium manufa battery manufacturers is so high that it becomes difficult to change. And sunk cost in, can be in terms of uh, money or it can be in terms of how long your contracts of supply are. So if you have very long term contracts of supply, uh, then uh, it is difficult for a new player to come uh, come in quickly. Last words, Juvin, there is a question on capacitors, which I request that you answer uh, separately uh, to the people who are asking. Uh, but last generic words. I mean, the panel has already covered uh, everything with respect to right from, you know, uh, the entire value in the supply chain, right from the next big solution in terms of battery technology to the challenges that a potential technology could face and the role of a government could play in terms of scaling up the new technology, right? I think uh, that pretty much sums up what I have to say as a panelist in terms of the uh, the next big thing or the holy grail in battery technology, right? But I kind of resonate with what Adam has said, right? Right. Uh, ensuring that uh, your new technology is not fundamentally reinventing the wheel, but rather reinventing the way we power the wheel would be a much quicker way to get a technology closer to commercialization. Right? Another important aspect that at least we've understood through our development process is that you, know, you cannot have a perfect chemistry ready and then go for commercialization. Right? Two important aspects that needs to be noted before you get anything closer to the market is that is the battery safe for a daily use? Right? When I say daily use, is the battery safe if your family members has to use it on a daily basis, if that is the first box that you take, I think rest everything follows. Right? Because safety is the most important aspect of battery technology. Like Adam mentioned, 30% is the state of charge in a lithium ion when it is being transported. The only reason why sodium is getting so much of attention is because sodium can be discharged all the way up to zero voltage, right? Which makes it that much more safer in terms of transportation. We have seen what happens when batteries catch fire. Node 7 is a good example. We've seen multiple instances, right, where you have an aircraft falling down because the entire battery got fired, right. So the next big battery technology would be something which can be manufactured in the existing manufacturing process. That's a mandate which I have given to my scientists from day one that, you know, instead of reinventing the wheel, reinvent the way we power the wheel. So we use technologies which are already commercially available. So it's like a drop-in replacement for the existing technology. Second very important aspect in terms of getting a technology closer to commercialization is the safety aspect and recyclability of the entire battery. Right? The second life or end of use for batteries is a very important aspect, which is still at a very nascent stage. Today, when you recycle a battery, you get anywhere close to 7 to 13% in terms of extraction. Is there a way we can increase the recyclability and increase the extraction more than 13%? Right? That's where things get gets even more interesting. And you know, there'll be a lot of focus in terms of end of use for batteries and various other auxiliary applications for batteries. I think if we are able to check these three main boxes in terms of getting developing a solution or getting a technology closer, I think we would have potentially, maybe not the next couple of decades, but we could have a solution as early as in the next four or five years. Right? So we, I speak to a lot of people from Eurobat and there are pretty much very new interesting chemistries coming up. Even derivatives of lithium-ion battery, right? for example, NCA. The, the, the entire percentage of other elements in an NCA battery is very less compared to an uh, LFP or an LMO or an uh, NMC, right? So you can also reduce the per, per, uh, per, uh, per, uh, constitution of a particular metal in a lithium-ion battery and thereby make it much more environmentally friendly and much more environmentally safe. Very good. So basically the points which you have brought in is that let the perfect not be the enemy of, of the good all the boxes will not tick. And I was reminded when you spoke about that, as well as safety, I was reminded when the Washington washing machine was launched, that time, the only appliance in homes was the bulb. And there were no switches. You had to straight away connect the bulb to the socket. And then it used to burn. And the switch idea had not come. And then when you wanted to, uh, to put it off, you had to use a cloth and uh, unturn the bulb and uh, that's how it used to be. So when the washing machine was launched, they felt this is how the washing machine will also connect into that socket. But they realized very soon that when the woman is connecting the washing machine like that to the socket, her hair is getting caught in the washing machine and you know, there's damage happening. So, so they said uh, that, okay, we'll think of something, but 
right now they give they went for a very huge uh, education campaign that tie your hair into a bun uh, before you start off the uh, the washing machine because the switch or that concept was not there or socket concept was not there you are saying let's go ahead with those inventions take all the safety precautions let the hurdles not be the reason for us to uh, stop our or retard our progress great points and all, another point which you have made is about the recyclability of uh, these uh, elements and that good recovery uh, through recycling will also make sure that whatever we are using that we do not run out and can be reused great points thank you very much a uh, great panel and great audience also such a large number stays with us right up to the end really very uh, appreciative and i think it is because of uh, the quality of the di dialogue which the panel has uh, come out with that this happens so thank you very much panel and uh, siddharth thank you uh, thank you very much sir it was such a pleasure listening to you all the varied perspectives that we've got on the table uh and so many nuggets for our leaders to take home today and thank you mr choudhry how well moderated uh, i'm still receiving positive messages from our leaders through email and on linkedin as well uh while a lot of the questions have been covered wonderfully and has given us a well rounded idea of the landscape we've also received specific and focused questions which may require longer and more one to one discussions between leaders in the audience and our experts which we would be happy to fix meetings between you and our pool of experts in the in the e-mobility field for mutual benefit as well and thank you to our uh, attendees for staying till the end whether you would like to engage with us on our expert panel or as learners you're invited to connect with us for membership we're soon launching our digital professional network and we will be sending out invitations to the first select 1000 leaders across our four sectors of healthcare e-mobility energy and real estate So thank you again uh, panelists and thank you again audience for joining in